Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. We are doing a Bhagavad Gita summary. Today we're going to start with chapter 11. Our uh, aim is to go for about four chapters, four or five chapters. Uh, the format, Yogeshwar is going to talk about uh, his summary of the chapter. And then uh, I'm going to talk about very briefly about the highlights that I noticed. Um, and then we're going to go to the next chapter. After we are done with all the chapters, we'll be able to discuss. So please keep track of all your questions, all your comments. We'll have plenty of time to discuss afterwards. So let's get started. Uh, Yogeshwar, go ahead. Krishna has talked about all his vibhuti of how he can be known through the manifest. Now Arjuna is now asking that, yes, you have told me how you're supposed to be known through the manifest, but I want to see who you truly are. I have known you by the words that you've told me. Yes, I can see it. But then who you truly are behind, behind all this, I want to see. Eva metad. Yathatthatvam atmanam parameshwara drashtumichami te rupam aishwaram purushottama. I want to see that aishwarya that you're talking about. And I want to see your own being, what it is. And Arjuna asks for it really gracefully. He says, he says that if you see that I am a patra, that I can hold what you're going to show me, then show it to me. If you really feel that I have gotten to, this, to the stage whereby you can show me and I can see, then show me. Normally, what we would normally want to think is that whatever the truth is, we should know all the truth that it is. But this is what Indian tradition holds, that the truth will only be revealed to you when you yourself can hold the truth. Because in a way, we shall also see by the end of chapter 11, what Arjuna goes through when he sees the truth. Because the truth is something that is experiential, first of all. And the other thing is that you first need to be able to hold the truth. And then it is revealed to you. In a way, the truth is all around us. Why it is not shown to us, why it doesn't reveal itself to us, is that we are not in that sthiti. We are not in that, on that stage that we can be revealed to the truth. And Krishna then says that, look at me. I have all this within me that I've talked about, all the Ishwar. And you can see all the world just in this one body. However, Natumam Shakya Sedrash to Maman Ane Neva Swachakshusha Divyam Dadami Te Chakshu Pashyame Yoga Meshwaram. I need to give you this Divya Drashti from which you will be able to see what the truth is. You will not be able to see what the truth is just on your own right. What Krishna here is doing, because in a way, some things that cannot be shown, which are experiential, have to be given words. And when you give experiential things words, what happens is you have to give them words like a metaphor, because Arjuna is asking to be shown what the truth is. When you want to see, 
You need eyes to see. Now, when the truth reveals itself to you, not necessarily is it that uh, you will see it like through your eyes, that the eyes that we have, you'll experience it. But even Krishna himself is saying that I will give you this Divya Drashti. Why is it called Divya Drashti then? If Arjuna doesn't need another set of eyes to see the truth, because the truth cannot be seen through the eyes. What Krishna is doing, he is saying that in my presence, because as we know that in the presence of a great guru or a great teacher, the truth can be revealed to you because the teacher is the truth himself. What Krishna is trying to do is reveal himself to Arjuna. That cannot happen without Krishna allowing Arjuna in. When Krishna allows Arjuna in is only when this can happen. And this needs to be given a metaphor. Krishna is saying, I will give you that which, what is needed to see me, to realize the truth. And that is the Divya Drashti that Krishna is giving Arjuna. And here now we see that Sanjay comes in and says that I also had that experience. I may not have had it as, as great as Arjuna had it, but I also saw something in Krishna at that moment. So Sanjay is saying that I saw that Krishna had the light of thousands of Suryas, thousands of suns. Divi Surya Sahasrasya Bhaved Yuga Padutthitaha Yadi Bhasa Drishi Sasyad Bhasa Stasya Mahatmanaha If thousands of suns rise at once and how much light can it give? If that can happen, so this is what even Sanjay is saying, Yadi, if that happens, and you can see how much light that can bring, that is how much light Krishna had. And tatrekastham jagatritsnam ravibhakta manekadha apashyad deva devasya sharire pandavastada. The whole world could be seen within Krishna. This is the experience of Sanjay, who is experientially, maybe not getting it as great as Arjuna, but even is receiving a glimpse of what Krishna is. And he sees it as this. Arjuna now comes on and says that, this is what I'm saying. Pashyami devans tava deva dehe sarvans tatha bhuta vishesha sangan brahmanam isham kamala sanastham rishins cha sarvan uragans cha divyan. I can truly see everything within Krishna. I am seeing all the devas, all that you have told me in chapter 10. Because those are the devas, like those are what Indian tradition takes as deva and worships them. But what now Arjuna is saying is something different from chapter 10, but it's also related to chapter 10. What chapter 10 was saying is that you can see the unmanifest in this manifest form, which would be given a form of the devas. Now here in chapter 11, what Arjuna is saying is that within you, Krishna, I can see all those manifest things. So twofold, you can see the unmanifest in the manifest and you can see the manifest in the unmanifest as well, both ways. I can see the force of creation within you. 
I can see the force of destruction within you all together. And I am seeing all the living things within you. What Arjuna means by this is that I am seeing all living things within you, meaning I can see the force of creation, how living things come about. I can also see the destruction. And this is an essential thing that he sees living things. He sees what life is within Krishna. And Krishna is the most lively person at that point in time. He can see all the life that can generate or destroy or even be what is giving everything else life because that's how much life he has. Arjuna sees him because Arjuna himself is a Kshatriya. So he sees Krishna in a way that relates to him. So this is what Arjuna is saying. Kiritinam gadinam chakrinam cha tejo rashim sarvato diptimantam pashyamitvam dur niriksham samanta diptanalarka dyutima prameyam. I can see you. You have, uh, you have a gada, which is a mess on, within your hands. You also have the chakra within your hands. So these are the weapons that normally Kshatriyas used to use that time. In a way, what will also happen when we receive what the ultimate true reality is, is also something like this will also see it through a lens through which we have been familiar with. We will also be able to see it through a lens that will reflect ourselves as well. So what the Gita is trying to say here is whenever you're shown the truth, you'll always have your lens on it. However, what you have to do is Try to clean your lens as much as possible so that when the truth is revealed, it can show more of the truth and less of you. Since you are here and the truth is there, the both are going to be seen in relation. You can never see them objectively as it is. You're always going to see it in relation to yourself. Whatever you reflect upon the truth, is there within you? And that's what is going to be reflected there. However, we can do something that cleans yourself so much that when you see the truth, more of the truth is there and less of you is there. And the part of you is also really important. How will you relay the truth to somebody who is next to you that this is what I saw? If you don't have a perspective on what the truth is, if you see the truth objectively rather than subjectively, meaning having your lens onto it, however fed it may be, but then that much part of you is there in the truth. If it is not there, then you will never be able to say something to another person that this is the type of truth I saw. Krish Krishna is showing himself to Arjuna. And Arjuna is saying that I can see you with all this good, that all the Mahatmas, all those who have reached are bowing down to you. And I also see that they are saying stutis of you, they are saying stotras of you, and they are worshipping you. They are trying to praise you in each and every way they can praise you, whether it's through karma, whether it's through speech, whether it's through music, whatever they can do. And I can see the greatest of musicians within you. I can see the greatest of persons within you. I can see the greatest of kshatriyas within you. I am seeing the whole world within you. And there's also another thing that I'm seeing within you, that Kala 
is also there within you. So we have talked about what the generative force is, force of creation, force of life, Arjuna has also talked about, that I can see all this within you, the Kshatriyas, the best of the singers, I can see that within you, I can see life within you. Now Arjuna is saying, I can see Kala within you, I can see the force of destruction within you. I can see you, that you have the most frightening type of eyes. I can see that you have the most frightening types of teeth. Rupam mahatte bahu bhaktra netram mahabaho bahu bahu rupadam bahu daram bahu danstra karalam shishtva loka pravethatyas tathaham I can see that your, the, your form is so great and it is like how I'm seeing it is your eyes are just red and your teeth are having this bahu danstra karalam means they are so frightening bahu daram and you also have so many vishwato mukham you also have so many faces that you face the whole world. The whole world faces you. That's what I am experiencing. And whenever you have an experience you cannot put really into words, you always have to use those kinds of metaphors to explain it. And those kinds of metaphors, they have a dual part in them. They have the point that they can reach from the abstract, the unmanifest, to the manifest. That's the best way to reach the manifest. However, when it gets to the manifest, now it can either be understood in the right way or it can be understood in the wrong way. Like now, this is what you will see. And if you don't see it, then it's not the truth. So there is a part of experience that Arjuna is trying to say, this is what I've experienced because I have experienced it. So this is what I have experienced. Now, you may experience something different, but this is my experience. And this is the words I'm trying to use. And these are the metaphors I'm trying to make them into a manifest. So this is my way of making them manifest. And I cannot know what the directions are. And I can also not get to know who I truly am. Like, I am everywhere, I'm in every place, and you are also in every place, I can't see. And the other thing also is that I can see all these Maharathis, Bhishma, Drona, Karna, all the sons of Dhritarashtra, they are dying within you, they're getting destroyed within you. So what we normally see is, yes, the Gita has shown that Krishna has so much love for Arjuna. But when we get to what reality is, reality holds everything, whether we like it or not. Like reality holds creation, life, and it also holds destruction. We have to prepare ourselves that, yes, we can see that the ultimate has a loving part of himself. But the ultimate also has this frightening part. And it's frightening less because it's there and more because we want to relate to it. Because when we see it, it's frightening to us. Like death is frightening in relation. Like if you always run away from it, it's frightening. But if you go head to head with it and you try to understand it, then you, you get in relation to what death is, then it's not frightening. It is, it's part of the truth. So we should try to understand what truth is. I can also see that your light lights up all the stars, the moon and the sun. However, the moon, the sun and all the stars, stars together cannot light you up. That is what you are.
And what Arjuna is now saying that I have seen all this, I have experienced it. However, Arjuna is again asking, Namostute Devavara Prasida Vigyatumichami Bhavantamadyam Nahi Prajana Mitava Prabhuttim. I cannot know what you are doing. I cannot know who you are. Have grace on me and tell me who you are. I bow down to you. Then Krishna says, Kalos miloka kshaya krit prabhuddho lokan samahar tumiha prabhuddha rite pitvam na bhavishyanti sarve ye vasthita pratyanike shuyodha. I am Kala and I am always moving towards the world and destroying it continuously. This is what truth is. And what happens is Arjuna has seen the gracious part of what the truth is. Now he doesn't have a question about the gracious part because we can relate to it. We can always think about the ultimate as having grace upon us. What Arjuna has a question about is the Ugra Rupa, the, the form that shows death, because we are not familiar with it. That Death can also be a form of the ultimate. And that is what Krishna is now revealing to Arjuna, that I am also that, know me. And Krishna here talks about what Arjuna's relation is in the war and what Krishna is doing in the war. The smatvamuttishthaya sholabhaswa jitva shatrun bhunksya rajyam samriddham what you have to do is wake up and fight the war. You are going to win the war. So get victory over the enemy. That is all fine. What you truly have to know is I have already destroyed everyone. Know me. Because I am death. Who else is going to destroy everyone? I have already destroyed everyone. What you have to do only, Nimitta Matram Bhava Savya Sachin. What you have to do is Nimitta Matram Bhava. You only have to be a Nimitta Matra. You only have to do like Krishna is playing the flute and become the flute. When Krishna is playing the tones, it is not the flute that is playing the tones. No, it's Krishna who is going to be playing the tone. However, just be so empty within that you can allow Krishna's tones to flow from within you. When that happens, you are truly Nimitta Matra. Then Arjuna continues, and the most important part of where Arjuna continues is, I have done wrong to you. I have now known you for who you are. You are my friend, and you have been my friend. And when you are my friend, we have done so many things in relation to a friendship. I may have wronged you or talked bad about you somewhere or in front of you. Forgive me for doing that because I can see that you are the ultimate. And I also bow down to you. Namo namaste stu sahasra kritva unascha bhuyo pi namo namaste. I truly bow down to you because I have known that you are the ultimate. When such an experience comes towards you, there's nothing else you can do than accept the experience that has befallen you. And Krishna, Arjuna is saying that I bow down to you. I can't even do it physically, but what I want to do is Sahasra Kritva thousands of times. 
पुनश्च भूयोपि नमो नमस्ते अगेन एंड अगेन नमो नमस्ते बाउ डाउन टू यू एंड अर्जुन ही यूजेस द वर्ड नमस्ते आई बाउ डाउन टू यू नम पुरस्तादत पृष्ठतस्ते नमोस्तु ते सर्वत एव सर्व आई बाउ डाउन टू यू फ्रॉम द फ्रंट फ्रॉम बैक फ्रॉम योर साइड्स फ्रॉम ऑल दिस डायरेक्शन I bow down to you. Why so? Because Arjuna cannot relate to which side Krishna is. Huh? He has his faces everywhere. Like which side should I bow down to him from? From everywhere do I bow down to you? You are my friend, and you know how a normal human being can be. So forgive me. How should you forgive me? For all the wrong I have done, you are the akshara. You are that which is never destroyed. You should forgive me like a father forgives his son, like a friend forgives his other friend, and a person who is in love with another person forgives the other person. तस्मात् प्रणम्य प्रणिधाय कायम् प्रसादये त्वामहमीश मीडियम् पितेव पुत्रस्य सखे वसक्यु प्रिय प्रियायार हसि देव सोढुं That's how you should forgive me and I bow down to you how do I do it I bow down to you प्रणिधाय कायम् साष्टांग नमस्कार as it is said in sanskrit with eight of your body parts you bow down to the ultimate i bow down to you because you are the only one who can be bowed down to then arjuna says that i have seen what you are but now i would like to see you in your original form what i used to see you like the friend that i used to see i have seen you for who you are but i relate myself more to who i used to see as my friend and then krishna says that yes i have shown you who i who i truly am using my grace and that's how only i can show you so don't be worried that is always good you're able to look at that form then krishna goes back to his original form that arjuna used to see as a friend then arjuna says that दृष्टेदम मानुषम रूपम तव सौम्यम जनार्दन इदानीमस्मि संवृत्त सचेतास प्रकृतिम गतः आई हैव कम बैक टू माय ओन स्टेट नाउ आई वाज सो हाइटेंड बाय द एक्सपीरियंस आई कुड नॉट स्टे विद इन दैट एक्सपीरियंस माय फॉर्म कृष्ण इज सेइंग इज सो हार्ड टू कंटेम्प्लेट एज यू हैव सीन and i cannot be known by any vedas i cannot be known by tapasa nadane na na chejaya only i can be seen by a person like you o arjuna na ham vede na tapasa nadane na na chejaya shakya evam vidho drashtum drishtavan simam yatha bhaktya tvananya ya shakya aham evam vidho arjuna ज्ञातुम द्रष्टुम च तत्वेन प्रवेष्टुम च परंतप द ओनली थिंग दैट कैन टेक अ पर्सन टुवर्ड्स मी इज भक्ति ओनली माय भक्त गेट्स टुवर्ड्स मी एंड दैट इज द ओनली वे यू नेवर गेट टू मी जस्ट बाय द वेदास यू नेवर गेट टू मी जस्ट बाय तपस्या जस्ट बाय दान और बाय डूइंग ऑल द यज्ञस you get to me 
through bhakti. Thank you. Thank you, Yogeshwar. Uh, I'll make some very quick comments. Um, first point is only somebody who deserves to see gets to see this. This is a very deep principle of uh, Indian thought. The second is that Krishna gives Arjun this divya drushti, this special vision. And what is he actually seeing? What he's seeing is the perceptual version of the concepts that he has described in the our previous chapter. He's actually showing you he, what he's seeing is he's seeing the full perceptualization of what the infinite looks like. We talked about we talked about the unmanifest as being vyapak. That means being very large and all encompassing, and sukshma. It is principle, just the center. So it is center and everything. This is Krishna showing Arjun just the, 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 the perceptual grandeur, everything in there. Yogeshwar has done a particularly fantastic job on this chapter. So um, I would recommend looking at these videos on chapter 11 in our YouTube again. Um, these, these are because it's a very difficult chapter to grasp and the full impact of that. So I, I recommend that highly. Last point I will make is that destructive potential is part of reality. It is creation, sustenance, and destruction. And that destruction <laughs> is the thing that Arjun sees and says, okay, you know, I, you know, he is overwhelmed by it. He's overwhelmed by it. And then he asks for his friend back. Uh, so uh, it is, you know, it's, it's a very unusual chapter. The first time I read it, I, you know, it took me some time to grasp, but what, what Krishna see is saying here is that I'm everything and this is a way of actually showing the idea that I'm everything perceptually. Uh, thank you. Uh, Yogeshwar, please go on. Now, Arjuna has come back to his To his own perception now and he can see Krishna how he was seeing Krishna as a friend as as a person he could love Arjuna is now asking about this question that how should you be worshipped what's the best way to worship you and I can see that so many people worship you in so many different ways so what is it how should you be worshipped Evam satata yukta ye bhaktas twampa yupasate ye cha pyaksharam abhyaktam te shamke yoga vittamaha. Out of all those, like the two ways mainly. One is your avyakta ru, another is your vyakta ru. So, how we should check it here is one is a way of Worshipping you as the unmanifest. Another is a way of worshipping you as the manifest. We know that there are so many ways of going wrong in both ways. And there are also so many ways of going right in both ways. That's why Arjuna is now asking, what is the best way to worship you? And considering the question, we should also consider the person who is asking and to whom the answer is going to be given. Krishna is now saying that whatever you do, the first verse says that whatever you do out of the two, if you can put all your being into me, 
whatever you do is fine. Maya Vishya Mano Yema Nitya Yukta Upasate Shraddhaya Parayopetas Deme Yukta Tamamata. I see as whoever can put his all being into me, that person is the best, whatever he does, out of the two. So it's not about one, if a person is worshipping in one way or the other, a person is greater or is less than the other person. It's not about that. Rather, it's about how you can get to the ultimate whatever you use. Getting to the ultimate or getting to the truth. Perspective. That should be considered. Not any other. However, Krishna is saying, since you have a question, I should also provide an answer that is relating to you. There is this avyakta part of me. And so many people, they worship that unmanifest part of me that unmanifest form that I am in. I am a chintyam in that form. Nobody can contemplate upon me. And I am achalam, dhruvam. That's how I am. So many people yeah, worship me in that way. That is fine. What they do is check all their senses. Take it away from the material world and pay attention to that which is not seen, the unmanifest. Then they will get to, they'll get to me. However, for you, Arjuna, there's a point to note that Klesho Dikata Rastesham Avyakta Sakta Chetasam Avyakta Higatir Dukkam Dehavad Bhiravapyate. There is an element of perseverance that you have to go through. You won't get any love on that, on, on that road because it's, it's the form of avyakta. Avyakta will not be able to provide any love to you, will not be able to provide any sort of like, you know, what a normal human being needs, love, emotions, any type of logic that you would want, any type of like, karma that you could do to get towards Brahman. It won't provide anything. You have to do everything that leads you towards Brahman on that road. However, Krishna is saying that if a person gets to my manifest form, what happens then? They can worship me in my manifest form as Krishna showed in chapter 10 and also in chapter 11. If you worship me in my manifest form, through the devtas, through something that you can see, but then get to the unmanifest within it, within the manifest, then what happens? It is way easier. And in a way, you get all the love from the people around you, the society. You can be with it and still worship. You can have all the emotions and put it into this manifest form. You can have all your karma and put it in this manifest form and worship me through the manifest form. In that way, since it relates more to the worldly way of living, that's why it is way easier to do. And even for you, Arjuna, it is way easier for you to do. What should a person do then if a person wants to go into the manifest form? Because avyakta is gatir dukkham. What should, what should be done? However, a person who leaves all the fruits of the karma, fruits of the action, and only gets towards me, mam dhyayanta upasate, I am the one who takes him from where he is and makes him one with me, makes him Brahman, one with me. What you have to do is always, continuously, contemplate upon me. Even if it's within the manifest form, if you can constantly contemplate upon me, then you can get to me. 
So Krishna is now laying out all those different ways that a person can get to Krishna, can get to any manifest form. Put all your mind, all your chitta into me. If you're not able to put a sthira chitta, an, a chitta, a mind that is not moving or diverting to other places into me, then what you should do is abhyas the yoga. You should constantly practice for that. If you can also not do abhyasa yoga, then mat karma paramo bhava. Constantly do action that is pointed towards me. If you're also not able to figure out what action is pointed towards me, what should you do? You should always do action for me, not for yourself. So this is where Krishna is saying that And also don't do that. Do something that remove all the karma follow from me. Remove all the arms of the Yogeshwar, uh, we have a problem with the audio. Sorry. Your last uh, two or three sentences. Okay. Can you hear me now or is it still? Uh, it is still very choppy. So Maybe I can stop my video and audio. Sure. Clear. Sure. Let, let's let's stop the video for a couple of minutes and let's try. Go ahead. Okay. So, if you're not also able to do karma for me, then. Uh, just a second. Uh, just hold on. Uh, Evanik, are you able to listen properly? He's choppy, but I can hear him. I can understand what he's saying. Okay. Um, oh, Yogeshwar has dropped off. Uh, yeah. Come back. Okay, there he is. I, there I, he couldn't, is. I couldn't understand him at all. Really? Okay. Yep. Um, let's see. Yeah, I could understand him, but it was um, choppy. I agree. So. It was very choppy. Um, give us a couple of minutes, folks. Uh, um, Go ahead, Yogeshwar. Okay. Is my audio now clear? Could you hear me? Yes, yes, audio is clear. Is it still not so clear. It is very clear. Go ahead. Okay, that's, that's good. Fine. So if you're not able to do me, then what you should do is constantly leave the desire for the fruit. Uh, Yogeshwar, sure. let's if try one thing. The desire for the fruit. Uh, Yogeshwar, sure. okay. uh, it's still kind of uh, very mixed. Uh, let's try. He dropped off again. Yes. So let's, uh, it should be back in a minute. Folks, oh, sorry about the technical issues. We will start shortly. I think he's still trying to connect to the video uh, audio. Okay, you guys should try it. Uh, you guys sure? Can you hear me? He's on mute. Okay. Uh, let me see. Okay. Uh, you guys sure? Can you try? Uh, you you'll need to unmute. Is it clear now? Should be clear now. Yeah, it is clear now. Go ahead. Another connection. Yeah. Yes. Krishna is now pointing out that you can use all these different ways of getting to, to the unmanifest, to that Brahman, which is there, through the manifest. One is constantly putting your mind into me. If you're not able to do that, then constantly practice 
Abhyasa Yoga. If that is also not possible, then always do karma that is directed towards me in relation to me. If you're not able to do that as well, then leave all the fruit, leave the desire for the fruit for all the actions that you're doing. That, if you do that, then you'll get to the Siddhi. Now, Krishna is now also moving on the other side that this verse is also really important, how Krishna is relating it. Shreyo hi jnanam abhyasat jnanat jnanam vishishyate jnanat karma phala tyagas tyagat shanti ranantaram even more valuable than even more valuable than constant practice is jnanam more valuable or greater than jnanam is dhyanam is your concentration if you can put your concentration into one one thing for a long period of time then you can know what it is constantly even better than dhyana is karma phalatyaga. If you're able to do karma phalatyaga, then you have done everything that has to be done. And we even get a better glimpse of this, having done all the chapters on the gunas. And in chapter 18, when Krishna reveals what karma is supposed to be like and how karma takes you to the siddhi, and how that siddhi again takes you above that. This is really important. One important aspect that we can see in the Gita is karma falatyaga. Don't allow any desires to come in, in your way when you're doing any type of action. That is the purest form of action. That is when action is called pure. What will a person be like when he gets to that stage? Adveshta sarva bhutanam metra karuna evacha nirmamo nirahankara samadukha sukhakshami. He will become a person who will not have any dvesha, any anger towards anybody else. He will not be able to be an enemy to be anybody else, only a maitra, maitra, mitra, which is called maitra, mitra se bhava, maitra. He will not have any mama, mamata, and he will also not have any ahamta. So these are two things, nirmama, nirahankar. Nirmama means he will not have mamata, nirahankara means he won't have any ahamta. He will be the same, whichever state comes to him, whether it's happiness or sorrow. Such a person is a person who has reached me. And a person who has really gotten to bhakti, who has gotten to the gist of what bhakti means, the love, the devotion, that has to come towards the ultimate. What is he like? Whatever type of manifest form or whatever type of peripheral comes to him. To other people, it may be like, this is shubha, this is something that is good, this is something that is bad. But for him, it is nothing. There is no good and there's no bad at the peripheral. The only good is to go towards the center. Tulya ninda stutir mauni santushto yena kena chit aniketa sthiramatir bhakti manya same priyaha. A person who is such bhakti man, a person who has that first type of bhakti, he is me priyaha. He is a person who is really a person who I love. 
ये तो धर्म्यामृतमिदम यथोक्त पर युपासते श्रद्धाना मत परमा भक्तास्ते वमे पिया a person who understands this and acts according to this is a person who i hold at most loving to me if a person a person who can be the same whatever comes from the outside within himself is the same that person is a person who i truly love thank you thank you yogeshwar um so this is bhakti yog and it is just beautifully expressed i have nothing nothing to add let us go ahead to the next chapter ath trayodasho adhyaya krishna is now moving on that there is this aspect about the body and you should know that there is a kshetragya within so this is the kshetra kshetragya vibhaga yoga that is the 13th chapter kshetram meaning the body that we have kshetragya meaning that which is within the body and which knows the body etad yo vetitam prahu kshetragya iti tadvida those who know they say that the kshetragya is he who knows what the body is he who sees the body is the kshetragya you should also know that the kshetragya is me there kshetragyam chapi mam vitti within all the kshetras within all the bodies of all the people i am the kshetragya if you get to know what the knowledge of kshetra and kshetragya is that is the knowledge i say yatta jnanam matam mam i call it knowledge so how are you supposed to know what the kshetra is the kshetra is said by so many people kshetra and chetragya which has been said by the brahma sutras said by so many upanishads what should what what should you know about it so the kshetra is made out of ahankara buddhi yeah indriya all that is part of the kshetra even the even the desire the happiness the sorrow all that is part of the kshetra all that is part of the body etat kshetram samasena savikara mudarita whatever krishna is saying savikara whatever has a way of changing itself it changes a state and a form over time then it should be taken under kshetra whether it's the senses or anything in the world or anything that you feel from within as well if it changes then it is part of the kshetra it's part of the body what is part of the kshetragya what is the gyanam that takes you towards the kshetragya so in verse 11 krishna says etat gyanam iti proktam agyanam yadatonya this is gyana so what is gyana krishna is saying before the 11th verse all those qualities that are amanitva madambhitvam ahimsa shanti reva arjavam all the qualities that we have talked about whether it is getting your senses towards the towards the center or it is leaving your the ego with the body that is also part of gyana and you should also know the real form of birth death old age distress sorrow 
you should all know the real states of all of them. When you know the real states of all of them, then you know what knowledge is. You have the knowledge that is supposed to be. What is the gyayam? What is supposed to be known by that which... So here Krishna is pointing out three things. The gyata is there, the kshetragya, the person who knows. The gyanam, the, the tools that he will use to get to what is supposed to be known, Krishna has also laid out. Now, gyayam, that which is supposed to be known by the tools and by the person who is knowing, the gyata. Krishna is now laying out the gyayam. What is the gyayam? Gyayam yatatra vakshyami yajjhyatva amrita mashnute anadimat param brahma nasatanna saduchyate what is supposed to be known is the anadi, that which doesn't have a start. And it also doesn't have an end. And it is Brahman. What Krishna here is saying is that you cannot call it Sat. You cannot call it as it is there. You can also not call it Asat. You cannot say that it is not there. Because what, when we say it is there or it's not there. What we are saying in relation is in relation to the manifest. It's never in relation to the unmanifest. So it is none of those. All those two are in relation to the manifest. What Brahman is, is the, something that is so vyapya. So asaktam sarva vritchaiva nirgunam guna bhroktiricha. Krishna puts all the two things that you can think about and puts them into one pass. Like Krishna says it's nirguna. It doesn't have any gunas within itself, within Brahman itself. However, it is guna bhokti. It is the one which has all the gunas within itself. Guna bhokti. Then Krishna says bahirantascha bhutana. Acharam charam evacha. It is outside, it is also inside of everyone. It is the one which moves and it is the unmoved. It is both. Then, sukshmatva tadavigyayam durastham chantike chata. It is so sukshma, it is so minute, so subtle, you can't really get to it. However, yeah, so it is a vigyaya. However, it is so near you that you can really know it at an instance. That is what Brahman is. Avibhaktam chabhuteshu, vibhaktam ivachasthitam. It is not cut apart at all. But how it is showing itself to us, it's like as if it's cut. It is showing itself somewhere, sometimes, at some points in time, and it's not showing itself in in some points in time. It is there at some time and it's not there at some time for us. However, it is there, but for us, sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not there. That is what Brahman is. Something that you cannot wrap your hands around. Jnanam gyayam, jnana gamyam, so Krishna has now talked about the Jnanam, the Gyayam, and the Jnanagamya. He has talked about the Kshetra, the Jnanam, and the Gyayam. All of them. Samasata. If a person gets to know what that is, then he truly knows. Krishna is now getting to the distinction between Prakriti and Purusha, distinguishing them. Prakritim Purusham Chaiva Vidyanadi Ubhavapi Vikaranscha Gunans Chaiva Vidhi Prakriti Sambhavan. You should also know the distinction between Prakriti and Purusha. Prakriti is, first of all, both of them have 
similar qualities. The similarity between both of them is that both of them are anadi. They don't have a start. Even Prakriti doesn't have a start. Even Purusha doesn't have a start. However, the other thing you should know about Prakriti is it is Vikarvan. It is always changing. And it has the three gunas within itself. That is what Prakriti is. Whatever you see as Karya and Karana, as the condition and the outcome that comes out. And even the Karana, that which is the link between those two, then it is all Prakriti. However, what Purusha is, is that which stays just with Prakriti, but is unstained by Prakriti. It is the drashta, it is the upamanta, it is the bharta, the bhokta, maheshwara. It is the seer, it is the one who, anumanta, it is the one without which, like if the purusha is not with the prakriti, prakriti will not be able to do anything. If the atman is not within this body, then the body will not be able to do anything on its own right. It just lays down. So with the effort of the Purusha, can the Prakriti do anything? How do you know what this is? Yeah? How do you know what the Prakriti and Purusha are? How do you get to them? Dhyane Natmani Pashyanti Kechidatma Namatmana Anya Sankhena Yogena Karma Yogena Chapare Anya Tweva Majhananta Shrutvanyebhya Upasate Tepi Chati Tarantyeva Vrityam Shruti Parayanaha Some get, just by putting their own attention towards the unmanifest, they get it. Others, they have to constantly practice dhyana. Others, they have to do sankhya yoga. Others have to do karma yoga. That is all fine. Then Krishna says that if you truly cannot get your own way, then what you have to do is hold the hand of a guru, a teacher, a master. If you can hold the hand of a master, he will show you the way. Krishna is saying that he will show you the way, but he will show you the way like Krishna is showing Arjuna. He's saying, you have to do this. I am here, so I will allow you to try this. And by your experience, I will tell you, is this your way or is it not your way? Then when you get your way, then you'll be able to walk. So until you get your way, you can take uh, you can take the hand of a guru until you get to know your way. All this that we can see is by the adjoinment of the kshetra and the kshetra kya. That is when all this that is manifest comes about. If a person really knows what this is, yeah, what the prakriti is and what the purusha is, and what Brahman is, then he truly knows. That is a person who truly knows. And that person, he may be in the body. He may be in the body, but no karma attaches to him. And he himself does karma like as if he's not doing anything. He's so light. He does karma in a way that he doesn't even touch. Kshetram Kshetri Tatha Krishnam Prakashayati Bharata. And there is this aspect of the Brahman. Yeah? And the way the sun lights up the whole world, it's the same way the Kshetra Gya, the Kshetra Gya who is the Kshetri, because they both mean the same thing. The Kshetri 
and the kshetra gya mean the same. So the kshetra gya lights up all the kshetra, all the body, and allows it to do any karma. Kshetra kshetra gya yorevam antaram jnana chakshusha bhuta prakriti moksham cha ye viduryanti te param if a person gets to really know what the kshetra and the kshetra gya is, then he truly knows and he gets to know what life is, gets to know what sansara is, and he also gets to know what moksha is. And he is the only one who gets to the beyond, to the ultimate. Wonderful. Uh, Yogeshwar, let's continue. I don't have anything profound to say here. So let's let's continue. Yes. So um, also on chapter 13, I would like to say the really good example, because this is mostly Sankhya. Now, what comes from chapter 13 up to chapter 18 is mostly Sankhya Shastra, whether it is the Chetra Shetra Gya Vibhaga Yoga, or it is the gunas, it is all part of the Sankhya Shastra. And Sankhya Shastra has a really good example of showing all this. The example of the mirror, the example of the glass rather. So when we look at a glass in front of us, we can see that which is past the glass. That is called the sansar in front of us. When we're not looking keenly, on the glass, we see that only the sansara exists. We only pay attention to what is there beyond the glass, which is the sansara. What happens slowly by slowly is that when you look at the glass so keenly, then you realize that there's something that is on the glass. There's a reflection on the glass, which is of yourself, who is on this side. When you realize there's a reflection, realize that not only is there something on the other side, there's also something on this side of the glass. That realization is the realization of the kshetragya within you. If you put it in terms of purusha and prakriti, the prakriti is that which is beyond the lens of the glass, and the purusha is that which you first see, the reflection of yourself on the glass. However, the Brahman is beyond that reflection as well, because even the glass is part of the Prakriti itself. So until you're seeing a reflection on the Prakriti, you have not really seen the Brahman. When you see, actually in a way, you can't see what is on this side, because when seeing happens, it only happens on the glass. You cannot see yourself. The eyes cannot see themselves. What needs to happen is experience yourself. Pay attention to yourself. All this time you've been paying attention to what is on the other side of the glass or what is on the glass. Now it's time to pay attention to what is on this side of the glass, what is beyond, that which is inside of you, rather than that which is seen through the lens, through the glass of the mind. What we now have to do is pay attention to what is within now. So that is the most famous example that is given in the Sankhya Shastra. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Yogeshwar. Please go on. Atha Chatur Dhyayaha. The 14th chapter is now talking about the Gunas. Now, in the 14th chapter, the Gunas are talked about in a specific way. It may not relate to our normal knowledge about the three qualities of Prakriti, the three gunas of Prakriti. However, you realize that this unique perspective is also really important. Krishna is laying out, what does sattva mean? What, will, what does rajas mean? What does tamas mean? All the Prakriti is what the manifest is. And it has the three qualities, sattva, the rajas, and the tamas. 
And these three are what bind any, any person to the manifest. So what is sattva? Tatra sattvam nirmalatvat prakashaka manamayam sukha sangena badnati jnana sangena chanaga Starting with sattva, Krishna says that it is nirmala. It is so clean. It is so pure. That is why it is without any bad deeds and it is with light, prakashakam. It has all the light within itself. Then what does it do? Sukha sangena badnati, dhyana sangena chanaga. It binds people to their bodies with two things, with happiness and with knowledge. These are qualities of uh, sattva. So even sattva, Krishna is saying, it will bind you to your body. It's not that when you get to sattva, that's the last stage. No, you're still within your body. You have to get beyond that. Rajas, however, is made out of desire, Trishna. And it's made out of attachment, Sangha. How it binds a person is through karma. Because a person who is in rajas constantly is in the loop of karma. He can't leave the karma. And why can't he leave the karma? It's because of the desire that he has. It's because of the attachments that he has. What is tama then? It is that which dilutes. And how does it dilute? What does it have at its peripheral? Is pramada, is alasya, and it's nidra. It is the boredom that comes onto you. It is the neglection of your own action that takes you into tama. And it is the sleepiness that takes you into tamas. What Krishna is now talking about here is really profound concepts about Sankhya is that if any has to be prominent because all the three are always there within a person. It's never that they can, that one is not there in a person. All the three stay together. However, at any one point in time, one is prominent and the other two are passive. Realizing that, then even for one to be prominent, like for Rajas to be prominent, the other two are the basement for the other to be prominent. It is like if one is prominent, the other two are helpers. Knowing that, you should be able to contemplate upon them, to know them within your life. And be able to use them within your life. Use them to your betterment, whichever it is. And whenever, and, and it's a loop, Krishna is saying. So the rajas will bring about the desire. However, Krishna is also saying the other way around. The desire itself will also bring about the rajas. Lobha prapruti rarambha karmanama shamas priha rajas setani jhayante vivridhe bharatarshabha Both sides will happen. If you have the lob, the lobha the, and the desire to do karma always, then they will happen in rajas. That is one perspective. And then they will also evolve from rajas and they will bring back, they will generate rajas again. So you'll be in a constant loop within that guna. If a person is always neglecting his action, his duty, what happens is he will become bored in his life. He'll go into tamas. Now that tamas will also bring other reasons for him to become passive within his life, to go into tamas. It's a constant loop. And when one goes into pralaya, when one is 
going into destruction, the other two arise and one of them becomes prominent within themselves. Then Arjuna asks, How does a person get beyond these three gunas? Because these three gunas, as, you know, as you've mentioned them, they are part of the prakriti. They are not beyond the prakriti. They are not towards the ultimate. What we should now really know is that Arjuna understands this, that it is all part of Prakriti. And Krishna is now going to show him a way to go beyond the Prakriti and also realize that other people are there who have gone beyond the Prakriti and how to know them. Prakasham cha pravrittim cha mohameva cha pandava nadveshti sampravrittani if you have knowledge, if you have the pravruti in karma, the going on of karma, the desire of the action, and moha, delusion, one thing you have to do of three of them, do not run away from any of them, and also do not go within any one of them, do not want any one of them. Na dveshti, na sampravrittani. Do not run away and also do not get involved within one of them. See that your body is involved within one of them. Your body is feeling light and is feeling prakashvan, is feeling like as if it is getting all the knowledge within itself. See that that is happening, but see that the experiencer is distinct from that experience. When you realize that, then you slowly get the separation between the gunas and the person who is experiencing the gunas. Udhasina vadasino gunaidyo navichalyate gunavartanta ityeva yova tishthati nengate a person who gets to know the gunas and doesn't get involved within them. If the gunas have a certain type of quality, may it be rajas or tamas, doesn't get involved with them, knows that the gunas will continue their cycle. He doesn't even touch them and also doesn't run away from them. Sama dukha sukha swastha. He is the same within sorrow and happiness. And the main thing he is swastha. Now swastha is normally translated as health, but as I had previously also pointed out, swastha rather means swastha, meaning staying within yourself rather than staying within something that is not you. So when you're in your own way, when you're within your own self, then you are swastha. You are not deluded by anything that is at the peripheral. You should also continuously go towards Brahman, continuously with Bhakti Yoga. Mamyo Yavicharena Bhakti Yoga Nasevate. He who continuously does bhakti yoga towards Brahman loves only Brahman, not anything at the peripheral, will get to Brahman, will be able to distinct himself from the prakriti. Brahmano hi pratishtaham amritasya vyayasya cha shaswatasya cha Shashwatasya cha dharmasya sukhasya kantikasya cha. He knows that Brahma, Brahman is the only way of staying in one step. And because it's the only way of staying in one step, that which changes is prakriti, that which stays in one step is Brahman. That is the only way 
you can get to the Shaswat Dharma. That is the only way you can get to Ekantika. Ekantika, meaning the Anta is only one. The end is only one. It is Brahma. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Yogeshwar. Um, so I have a question for you. Uh, we have about 20 minutes. What I was thinking is that 18th Adhyaya is very long uh, for tomorrow. And tomorrow also, it would be better to leave more time for Q&A. So can we do Adhyaya 15 uh, today? Um, yes, yeah, we can do Adhyaya 15 today. So that way, we'll have only three Adhyayas to go uh, tomorrow. Go ahead. Sure. Uh, sure. Now, Krishna is understanding that, you see, we have come from the part of looking at Brahman. But then, when Krishna talks about the Prakriti, talks about the Maya now, the Gunas, Arjuna is not really being able to grasp his hand around it. So Krishna is taking him back onto the Brahman what Brahman is, what evolves from the Brahman, how the link has been established between the unmanifest and the manifest. Udhamula madha shakham ashwatham prahuravyayam chandansi yasya parnani yastam veda sabeda vit adhas chordham prasritastasya sakha Guna pravridha vishaya pravala adhascha mulanya nusantatani karmanu bandhini manushya loke. This whole sansara, which we are able to see, it is urdhva mula. It is a tree which is upside down. It is a tree which has its roots up and its branches are downwards. And this tree is up there, it never dies out because as we know, Prakriti is Anadi and Ananta never dies out. The leaves of this tree are the Vedas. That is how this tree is able to flourish within itself because knowledge always gives its rasa. Like for example, the leaves of a tree they are able to make their own food for the tree. This is how the tree is able to make its food through the leaves. So knowledge constantly is able to sustain the tree, allow the tree to make its own food. Knowledge sustains itself. Knowledge sustains this whole world. Without knowledge, this whole world will fall apart. And a person who knows this, yeah? who knows this tree, not the leaves only, not the Vedas only, not only the branches, not only the stem, or not only the roots, the whole of it as it is. He knows, and he is the Veda view. The branches are all over the place. They're downwards, they're upwards as well. And what allows them to grow is the, are the three gunas. And how the gunas also grow are through the vishayas, through the sense objects. You need something on the outside to allow you, allow the gunas within to grow as well, to manifest outwardly. And also, adhas chamula nienu santatani, the karma is what binds everything together. It what joins everything together. From the unmanifest to the manifest, and even on the manifest to show it out, because even the mind is part of the manifest, but is not really shown up. So karma is there at every level, whether it is at the level of the unmanifest towards the manifest, or it is towards the mind, towards the world. All of it, karma is a part of that cycle. 
निर्माण मोह जित संग दोषा अध्यात्म नित्या विनिवृत्त काम द्वंद्वैर्मुक्ता सुख दुख संगे गच्छन्त्य मोढा पदम अव्ययम तत् इफ अ पर्सन नोज दिस एंड देन ही इज डिलीव ही इज गिवन फ्रीडम फ्रॉम इट लाइक ही इज डिलीवर्ड फ्रॉम इट देन व्हाट हैपेंस इज ही गेट्स टू द अव्ययम पदम पदम अव्ययम तत् दैट स्टेट from which he never comes back which state is it then natad bhasayate suryo na shashanko na pavaka yad gatva na nivartante tad dhama paramam mama that state is which no any star or the sun or the moon can light it up but it rather lights up the stars and the moon now arjuna has already had this experience krishna is just reliving the experience for him is saying the experience and arjuna can realize that yes this is the experience i had and that is where i have to stay that is what i have to hold on to to get to brahma the shotra the chakshu the sparshanam and the rasanam and the ghrana those are the five senses the mind is the sixth of all these five and it stays on those five senses and controls them if a person also goes beyond that mind then is able to know what is beyond the manifest krishna continues that there is that which is beyond the man the manifest and it stays within your hridi within your hridaya sarvasya chaham hridi sannivishto matta smritir gyana papohanam cha vedaischa sarvairaham eva vedyo vedanta krit ved videva chaham i am he who stays within the hearts of everyone and from me is remembrance coming out is knowledge coming out everything comes out of me even the vedas and who is that me so first krishna is now bringing the distinction again dwavimo purusho loke sharas chakshara eva cha they are two within this world there is the kshara which is the manifest it's always continuously changing it's has destruction within itself so it is kshara means destruction and there is the akshara that which never gets destroyed krishna is saying kshara sarvani bhutani so kshara is all that we are seeing around us utasthokshara uchyate that which never changes is the akshara kutastha meaning stha meaning it stays and kuta means on its own right it stays as it is it doesn't need to lean on anything else to stay as it is but on its own right does it stay as it is however krishna says now uttama purusha stvanya paramatme tyudharitah beyond these two levels krishna is saying uttama purusha stvanya the uttama purusha is the third and that is what is called paramatma paramatme tyudharitah yo lokatraya mahavishya vibhatyavya ishvara that parmatma is with his antaryami form within everything even within the shara and even within the akshara he is within he is within the prakruti and he is also within the akshara the akshara meaning the atma the jiva 
यस्माच्छरमतीतोहम अक्षराद पिचोत्तम अतोस्मि लोके वेदे च प्रथित पुरुषोत्तम बिकॉज आई एम बियॉन्ड द क्षर दैट विच गेट्स डिस्ट्रॉय एंड आई एम ऑल्सो बियॉन्ड द अक्षर दैट विच डजन गेट डिस्ट्रॉय दैट इज वाय आई एम कॉल्ड पुरुषोत्तम I am beyond the prakriti I am also beyond the purusha that is why I am the purushottama whether it is in when in the vedas or it is within this world whole world I am called the purushottama now normally we divide it that there is the known which is the manifest the prakriti and there is that which doesn't show itself and it also doesn't get destroyed which is the akshara krishna is saying that i am none of them first understand this however i am in both of them i am the third i am that which stays beyond that which is destroyed and that which never gets destroyed i am the third beyond all these two yoma mevam sammudho janati purushottam स्पेसिफिक वे वी कैन अप्रोच द ब्रह्म हाउ we should also know that the other ways of approaching brahman are also there within us like we may be into jnana yoga maybe 70% but there is also this part of karma yoga we have to do the 30% yeah so don't live alone any stone unturned like use everything that you can use use all the tools at your disposal make them the best you can make them and go towards brahman it is like saying that i will not just be any other flower that comes to the feet of the ultimate no i will not be any other flower i'll be a flower that has flowered fully within itself i will be a flower that has the best scent within itself and then i will get to brahman डन whatever is supposed to be done has been done already for him in relation now there is nothing for him to be done nothing else has to be done for him this is a person who knows the guhyatama the most secretive of all and this i am telling you or arjuna because i have the utmost love for you because i know that you can get to me and this is the way you can get to me wonderful thank you thank you yogeshwar so folks um we have covered up to uh chapter 15 so tomorrow we are going to do 16 17 and 18 so now i'm going to open it up for uh any comments any questions uh i know that yogeshwar will need to leave in about 7 minutes uh so let's start with questions if if anybody has any questions um we can start with that evanik go ahead hi yogeshwar uh thank you again for doing this um uh, i just have a simple question and i thought that sanjay and arjuna were the same person and then in chapter 11 they were not 
can you explain that? <laughs> yes, so Sanjaya is the charioteer of Dhritarashtra. So Dhritarashtra is the king at that time, and Sanjay is the chariot of Dhritarashtra. He's the one who is relaying what has happened during the war to Dhritarashtra. Arjuna, rather, is one of the Pandavas. Now, Dhritarashtra and Pandu are two brothers. Pandu, from Pandu, five sons Pandu has, which includes Arjuna. However, Sanjay, who is the chariot of Dhritarashtra, is just relaying the story of Mahabharata, of the Gita, to Dhritarashtra, like what is happening at the war. He's not part of the war at all, but he's just relaying the information. Thank you. Uh, Joe, go ahead. Yeah, I just need a point of clarification on chapter 13, because that was one of the more challenging chapters that we we covered, because it kind of gets to um, the nature of the Gita, uh, depending on how you interpret it. But basically, um, we're breaking it down to the, the person that knows, the tools to know, and the knower or what would be knowledge is that i mean am i do i have that framework correct because i just want to make yeah i need to make sure because i had in my other notes something about uh the field and the object of knowledge yes so um to put it into english terms would we'll say the knower the known and okay. then the knowledge Okay. Those are the three faculties that will come about. Okay, thank you. Wonderful. Um, so folks, now if anybody has any comments, now we can do a general discussion at this point. So um, you can bring up anything that you want to bring up uh, and we can we can go from there. Go ahead and type exclamation mark if you would like to share your comments. If you would like to raise any questions, uh, we're going to start with Evanique followed by Joe. Evanique. So yeah, so um, I think chapter 11, I got so much out of it because we went through the summaries. And so what I saw was, um, like I see Arjuna's journey and how he's pursuing knowing Krishna and that's what leads him that's what leads Krishna to show him who he is but Arjuna had to go to the journey through the first 10 chapters and really seek him out and continuously seek him out so I just thought that was amazing we always talk about this you always talk about this Sheree Kant about having to seek. And I think it's throughout, like you see it throughout the Gita and you see it even in the chapters after it, is that you have to ultimately be seeking um, Arjun. Like even if you went through the three, uh, even if you went through the three, I think it's the yogas, uh, karma, bhakti, and um Yana yoga. Yana, yana yoga. It it all has to be to seek the center, to seek like you that's where you're going. So if you're focused on that and your desire is that you'll get there. And the same with the gunas, the sattva, rajas, and uh tamas. Um, you know, like there's all three within us, and all three and all three are needed, which was hard for me because I always had a negative connotation at the Thomas Yoga. And I was like, well, I don't want to be, uh, I don't want to the Thomas Yoga. It seems lazy. It seems like the person that doesn't want to do anything, but that's needed as well. And like one is dominant and two is, um, and, and 
two are passive and then you know the destruction of one leads to the dominant not like pure destruction but like you know it's always going to be the one that's going to be dominant and that means the other two are going to play a lesser role and that they're all needed so i thought tonight was great so those are some of my comments sure so i'm going to comment on three things that you said um, and folks, um, now we're going to have a general discussion because we are wrapping up after almost 200 hours of discussions on Gita. So would love to kind of, you know, this is the time to kind of build, build things up. So um, please take your time to comment on anything that you would like to bring up, uh, especially for people who have been here for a long time. Um, would love to hear uh, your takes. So first part is um, about the seeking. You know, Krishna puts it very, very directly. He says, just seek me. You know, just focus on the center. You know, just be focused on me with everything you have. And that applies to bhakti yoga, karma yoga, and jnana yoga all together. Um, so try to know the center have a devotion to the center and act towards the center and do that as much as you possibly can in every way you possibly can. And that's it. So, so there is a unity to the yogas. You know, it is all directed, you know, attention is the primary capability that we have and just attend to the center, attend to Brahma is what is being said. Uh, the second point is that of witness. I mean, one of the deep ideas here is about the center being the witness. It is being conscious, conscious in the present. So for example, all the gunas, right? You think that, you know, if you are in sattvic, sattvic guna, then you are moving towards the center, but it is in pursuit of knowledge. It is good, but the consciousness, the actual experience of the center is something distinct from it. So the point that Yogeshwar made today is that, so firstly, um, I really like this entire uh, presentation of gunas across all these chapters. Firstly, because it is just identifies something very deep about human psychology, that we have the capacity of being sleepy. And you need to actually sleep, you know. So sleep is, you know, you're engaging in Thomas, you know, when you're sleeping and you need to sleep. You need to rest. At the same time, if you're going to be, if you're going to approach the life of saying, I will do nothing but that, then that's not good life towards the center. You're going away from the center all the time. Um, so it is, it is very this worldly in this way. In Rajas, it is all about doing, you know, being excited about doing something and doing your work, doing the work in order to achieve your values. So that is like going round and round, around the circle. Thomas is actually going away from the center, kind of drifting away from the center through either ignorance or laziness um, or anger uh, by saying no to the center. The Sattvic is moving towards the center. But all of these are movements which are part of the prakriti, part of manifestations. They're all ways of attention. What Gita says that the center itself is about purusha, which is about witness, about consciousness, pure awareness in the present where you actually participate in Prakruti, but it doesn't, you don't lose the consciousness in the process. That is Thita Pradnya, that means 
or yogastha. Stha means staying. So you stay in the state of being present, being conscious, being aware. Uh, so th those are the three points that I had. Uh, next up is going to be, uh, let me start with Marco and then Brian and Incho. Marco, go ahead. Uh, Marco, you need to unmute. Um, yeah, I um, I really like the part where, um, you know, he's um, like he's he's telling us that we're, you know, capable of of so much that we're sort of, you know, that we have a potential, and, um, you know, like seeing the whole world within us and um yeah it feels like um like a father telling his son that he has like all this potential and um and also you know that we are that you know we are potential um and um i guess my question was um how is um how is an emotion um and how an emotion uh in manifest form how does it become manifest and manifest i didn't understand that part um so by um manifest is actually almost everything that we see is manifest so a physical there is a physical manifestation of the table there is a manifestation of our knowledge we're saying when i know something that is manifest if you feel something, that is manifest. If you're taking an action, that is manifest. Unmanifest is the principle that is behind all of that. So think of it as, you know, if you want to look at physics, the universal laws of physics are unmanifest. So that because those laws are what they are, and they manifest themselves in all kinds of physical phenomena so it is the so unmanifest is the universal principle that is driving everything so in that sense you know because emotions are particular specific things that we feel that's why it is manifest uh, does that answer marco so like um if someone like makes a part is that would be like an emotion uh, being manifested uh, uh marco you're breaking up can you repeat what you said so like if if like a piece of art would, would that be like an emotion being manifested yeah absolutely uh, basically anything concrete manifest simply means everything that you see everything that you can feel everything is manifest so that's so manifest is the idea that 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 is the general idea that we have of what is, what we can see, what is perceptible, what is experienced. All of that is, is manifest. Okay. Uh, next up is Brian. Oh, sorry, Penny. Penny, you need to unmute though. Okay. Um, I just wanted a clarification because when he was talking, I think chapter 15, I think that he was saying that uh, Krishna, the Brahman, was saying basically that he's something that's beyond property and Purusha, but is in both of them, but is something beyond both of those. Right. So is that like he's beyond the manifest and the unmanifest? Uh, that, I mean, um, I, I, I will try to say something about it, but I don't know. I mean, the thing is that these things are very deep. What, what I think is being said there is that it is both. So that is, it is unmanifest and manifest both. So it includes both of them, something that includes both of them. So think of it, you know, the, it's the same point that was being made when it is saying it is vyapak or vast, which includes everything. That is the prakruti part. And it is sukshma, which is tiny almost imperceptible that is the universal 
and it is both. So it is the seed and its manifestation. So in that sense, it is something that encompasses both of them. That's as best as I uh, understand it. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Next up is Joe. And Joe, oh, by the way, I really liked your questions yesterday. So you guys can keep asking as, as many questions as, as you want. Uh, and if there are other people who have questions, we will intercede with, with them. So please go on. Yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot of information um, to to cover. Um, so, just uh, thinking about chapter seven or eleven, um, seven, eleven, um, that uh, that being worthy of being, uh, you know, of of the truth, and actually being exposed to the truth. Uh, is the first thing that came to mind is with Arjuna is is Krishna's you know saying or Arjuna that you're worthy of the truth. So then I thought about the idea of what is truth and you know kind of how do you get to that. And I thought the way Yogeshwar actually laid it out to us is reality is creative life and destruction, and then how we fear death, and then how death actually does more harm than death itself our fear of death does more harm than death itself so this understanding of truth by understanding that you're going to die then your fear is let go so this idea this and this happens on a you know grand scale this is just a small example of being exposed to truth and this is kind of uh what we've dealt with um with understanding the idea of attachment because then once you understand the truth about things you can detach yourself from them and that's a very very deep point um because then you can as we've talked about in the past uh put discipline yourself to deal with those things so uh that's what i took from chapter 11 Sure. Uh, you know, may, may I comment on Please it? do. Yeah. Please. Um, so, I mean, the idea of Om. Yes. Gains that. So what, what, you're, what you're doing when you're saying Om, like it is A, O, M. O is creation. O is sustenance. And M is destruction. So what you're saying in saying that is that you are accepting all these phases and all these phases actually apply in a scalable way. So for example, you know, Jordan Peterson makes this point, you have to let your false ideas die. You have to let your habits die and your growth actually depends on that. So accepting OM, accepting destruction as a natural part of life itself, of reality itself, frees you up actually to live. Because otherwise, if you're afraid of that part, which, which is inevitable on everything at every level, then that will just, that directly leads to attachment. Because you're trying to hold right. on to something that is actually dying and it doesn't work and it will hurt you in, in so many different ways. Uh, go ahead. Uh, no, it, I mean, and that kind of gets to to what we were talking about last night a little bit as well. Um, no, that, that, that's thank you for, I mean, sharing that. Th these, these are the, like the really tangible ideas out of the Gita that, you know, I'm pulling. You know, some some of it is so deep that I know it's deep, but I still need to work at it. Um, but some of them are, you know, you know, pretty. Uh, they're still profound to me. Um, chapter twelve. Uh, it's basically again we come back. I felt like to the idea of meditation and the importance of the meditation and bhakti yoga and being focused on God 
as in order to bring ourselves to the center. And if we allow ourselves to be distracted, therefore, then uh, we just we we tend to drift. Um, so, uh, but that being said, uh, while it is focused on bhakti yoga, we have talked about there are multiple paths to the center, which is something that really resonates with me when it comes to the Gita overall uh, and to in Hinduism, uh, because it's not dogmatic. Um, chapter 13 is... Uh, can I, may, may I comment on that? Okay, please go ahead. Interrupt uh, whenever, please. Sure, sure. I, I think that it kind of this back and forth actually works well. It and does. Hope uh, and the thing is that, you know, I actually, uh, Joe, what you're doing is that you're covering a large area and many, many, many people are going to be very interested in this discussion. So it is it is very good, you know, and uh, folks feel free to pipe in, uh, you know, just go ahead and type exclamation mark because it is only through this process of saying, what did, what did each of you get? And what is it, what are your observations that we can really understand this work? Um, so the point is that the idea of concentration is a fundamental idea of the Indian mind. Of It is not mindfulness. It is concentration. It is based on mindfulness. So you are aware and then you are keeping your attention focused on Brahma. And you're doing that. And that action actually runs across bhakti yoga, jnana yoga, and uh, karma yoga. So that, that idea of concentration, that keep your attention on Krishna, on Brahma, on the center, that is really the core, core idea. Okay, uh, let's go to Evanik and then come back to Joe. Evanik. Yeah, going off of what you said, Shurkan, I, I, I guess my question is then what is, and you probably said it and I'm still not getting it, but what is the difference between mindfulness and concentration? Because I thought that was kind, or is mindfulness, because when I think of mindfulness, I think of being present and, and focusing on what's in front of you. And that sounds like by your definition, concentration. So I just. Sure. Um, I mean, these are the two large schools of meditation uh, that come from India, mindfulness and concentration. Mindfulness is about simply observing what your mind is doing. You're not trying to do anything in particular. You are simply trying to notice what is happening. So you say, okay, these thoughts are passing through me. I am having these emotions. This is what my body is feeling like. Just noticing that, that is what mindfulness, a mindful meditation is about. And that is the base. That is the beginning of meditation, of being able to notice things. What concentration meditation is, it builds on that. It is saying that there is something like the center from which everything is coming and falling to. Can you keep your attention on that? So it is about willfully concentrating your attention on one point, which is different from just noticing where your mind is going. So that's, that's the difference. Uh, next up is uh, uh, Evan. That answers the question. Yeah, it does. But it just brought up another one. <laughs> sure, go ahead. Um, so I guess does Sema want to go first? Or yeah, let's let's go to Sema first. Sema, go ahead. So I okay. I guess I have to unmute myself. Okay, so I just have a um, question or maybe my understanding, I wanted to share my understanding with concentration uh, and the mindfulness. I thought um, mindfulness could be more broad, more um, in a way that, as you said, just being witness uh, of yourself, like doesn't matter what type of um, 
a feeling you are like the state you are either responsive or reacting or different feelings might come and go uh, but just maybe without judging yourself or maybe getting too much cut of that just being a little far from that and just observing um, without really getting attached or uh, emotionally reactive to that situation or state and the concentration is I thought um, mostly maybe the tool or an approach to uh, to be able to to be able to to focus on on on, on an object uh, on a um, how do you say intention like like concentrating on my breathing um to bring that mindfulness to to myself that's how i uh, thought but um sure. I, I think important too sure I, I i you're right about the mindfulness part the yeah. concentration part is a very deep field very okay. well. i mean that is like sure. uh you, you have to read like what patanjali, patanjali's yoga sutra is about mm -hmm. that there is a lot of uh text in gita about that and the height of that the, the purpose of concentration is i mean you can do exercises of saying okay now focus on your breathing that is a step but that is a means mm -hmm. the, the the purpose of concentration is to focus on the center mm -hmm. uh, so that that's a very very deep idea in the indian culture okay, okay. uh thank you thank you sema great question uh, next up is evanik followed by joe evanik so uh, i guess my question is how do you choose what to focus on to get you to the center like I know there's three different ways you could do it through yana yoga, karma yoga, and bhakti yoga. But I, I guess the question I have is like, how do you choose that path? Right. I mean, the, the way in which uh, Krishna explains to Arjun is really, really, it's very gentle and very beautiful. Uh, you know, he again and again describes, you know, you are a Kshatriya, you're used to doing action. So karma yoga is probably going to work. You also are my friend. So for it, it is easy for you to have devotion for me. So you can do that. Uh, you know, in terms of jnana yoga, uh, you know, try to know. Uh, and he will say, some people find this easy. Some people find it hard. So try everything. And then the point that uh, Yogeshwar makes uh, and Gita makes all the time is saying that um, know yourself. So you try to figure out what your own nature is. Uh, you know, the, it calls swadharma, or you know, basically, what is your nature? So you have to, and you act in accordance or swabhava. So like you act in accordance with your nature because if you try to act in accordance with something that is not your nature, it's not going to work very well. So it's it's a very um, it's a very flexible system. It is saying that, look, these are the possibilities that human beings have. Some people are stronger at this. Some people are stronger at that. I don't know what you can do and who you, I don't know who you are. That's what Krishna is saying to Arjun. Um, please, try to do this, try all of these things and use whatever is according to your own swabhav. So that is that is the um, thing. So it is not saying you, you must do this or you must do that. It just, it is giving you a platter of choices and you have to try them. And you say, look, this is really working for me. Um, and the beautiful thing is that if you, progress on one of those paths all the the other paths become easier so it's all leading to the same thing and your mind your actions and your emotions are are related to each other and any progress towards the center in one helps helps the other uh wonderful next up is uh joe joe Okay. 
Uh, which actually kind of gets to something in 13, uh, which is the, um, it, it, it's the, you know, the framework that was given to us, the, the number of the field the object of knowledge, mm -hmm. but also it's the importance of the persistence in knowing and mm -hmm. the self in that, in that particular, and, and knowing ourselves and the awareness of that. And so we can understand some of the basic principles that allow us to understand ourselves, um, but that you really won't know uh, the center until you actually have experienced, I feel, uh, in a way, um, Krishna, I mean, essentially understand Krishna. Right. Um, can I, can I say, say something? Pl yeah, please. Um, so like Kshetra means field. So that means all everything that is around you, that, that you know, the, the manifestation, that is the Kshetra, that's the field. Yeah. And Kshetra, Nya, Nya means the knower. So it is the, think of it, I mean, I think of it as the witness. So it's the witness of the field. So there is, and that Kshetra Nya is the same as the concept of Purush. It is the same concept as center of this awareness. So it is awareness. And um, the beautiful uh, metaphor that um, Yogeshwar talks about is that you have this glass, you know, you're seeing the world on the other side of the glass and you are aware of it. But in that act, you're mostly aware of, oh, there is a table. You're not really aware right. of who is seeing the table. And every once in a while, you get this quick reflection in the gl glass where you see, get a glimpse of the witness. But that also is through the glass, through the action. So there is like this, you know, the knower that is at the center, what is known, that is the Kshetra, that is the field, mm -hmm. um, what is to be known. And then there is the knowledge. So you can see the seer in the center, the scene, which is there, and sight, the means through which it is taking place. And all of this is Brahma. So it's all of this. So all it's it's like, think of it as the Trinity. Yes. It is the consciousness. The Holy Spirit is the consciousness. It is your awareness, your heart loving. The Kshetra in this case is uh, God the Father. And the means through which you get there is God the Son. So it is the, that's the means, that's the way. And all three of them are God. All three of them are Brahma. It is an idea analogous to this. That's incredibly helpful. And I was actually thinking about that too. Um, even, even, even in chapter 11 with this idea of being worthy of being revealed to God revealing himself, like, or, you know, Krishna revealing himself. Um, so, so I see similarities with both of those. Yeah, absolutely. It, it is there in the, see, the thing is that, you know, I, again, I want to bring up this topic because, um, you know, I am completely fascinated with uh, gospel of Sean and I, you know, and there are so many principles which are common, like let's say, those who are mine will see me. Those who don't, are not mine will not see me. So it's like, unless you have the Holy Spirit, unless you have the love of God, you're not going to see God. You know, you're, it, it could be standing right in front of you, but you won't see because you do not have the love in your heart or you do not want to see. And then, so you won't even see anything so it's the same thing like only when 
Arjun. So you can think like Arjun has that, you know, has the love for Krishna. So he wants to see. That's why in chapter 11, Krishna shows himself to Arjun. All these great sages and all the, all the devas, all the gods have also not seen because they have also wanted. But the thing is that he is a devotee. He is, he has the depth of emotion. He has the Holy Spirit. And only if you have that, then you can see. Go ahead. Uh, no, I mean, uh, that's beautifully put. And uh, thank you for that. I mean, I, I, it's, I'm starting to see the parallels now a lot, of, lot more clearly the more we talk about it. Um, yeah, in chapter 14, uh, you know, the thing that is, you know, again, interesting, it's the three gunas, but the most important thing is this idea of how to stay within yourself uh, within chapter 14. Um, and, and that how attachment to any of the gunas can actually prevent that from happening. Uh, so that's a, you know, that's a very deep point. Um, and, uh, as far as, you know, just again, knowledge of oneself, um, chapter 15, uh, let, let, can uh, I comment on this? Uh, yeah, so, go ahead. That's um, important. Yeah. Like the term that. Yogeshwar talked about swastha. It's really beautiful term because tha is place. Swastha, swa means you are own. So you are in your own place in the sense that you are centered and you are not, you are comfortable being there. You belong there and you are okay being there. Uh, and you are happy being there. So it is, so you're not running. And from that place, you are looking at everything and interacting with everything. So it, it is interacting, but interacting with having a stable place at the center from which you're doing that. So that's, that's a really, really, uh, you know, powerful concept. Go ahead. I think it's the most, I, one of the most powerful concepts that, that I've taken away from the Gita. Um, chapter 15, I just, my, my notes were short on that, just basically focusing on self-discipline and following the path to yoga, which uh, that's, you know, whatever path that may be for you. That's, it's a lot deeper than that. I have other notes on it, but that's mm -hmm. my main takeaway from this evening. Um, from that um, um let me do one thing oh, sorry go ahead uh i apologize oh you know you didn't you mm -hmm. didn't interrupt me um no i mean one thing that i, I was just going to maybe comment is that uh for understanding the center this still works uh -huh. yes. <laughs> it's still i mean it still works thank you thank you um so 